Ave Maria. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they got together, and to disconcert him, one of them put a question. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus said, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second resembles it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets also. The conflict between our Lord and the authorities continues. In fact, it intensifies as he approaches his passion. The Sadducees had tried to trap him over the question of divorce, and he had pointed out that they understood neither the power of God nor the scriptures. And so, using this as a base, we told the Pharisees when they heard this, when they heard that our Lord had silenced the Sadducees, they got together and put another plan in place. They would ask a question which would disconcert him. They were trying to show that he himself did not understand the scriptures. Master, one of them said, which is the greatest commandment of the law? There were many opinions about the answer to this question. There were those who thought that sacrifice was more important, and others thought that the keeping of the law itself was was, was um, primary. But what is the correct answer? You cannot, basically our Lord would say, that we cannot really offer, truly offer, sincerely offer sacrifice if we do not love. We can go through the motions, but there would not be love. And in fact, we can compare the love of three, three persons, three kinds of people. There is, first of all, the love that a son has for his father, which is a perfect love. He's willing to do whatever his father wills, whatever his father wants. And of course, our Lord is the perfect model of this, that he would fulfill, he would be obedient to his father, even to the point of death. There's another love which one can have, and this is the love of a hireling, someone who loves only because of the reward, the promised um, reward that is offered for faithful service. And in a sense, we can see that in the, um, the story of the prodigal son. The older brother was faithful, but he had hoped for a reward. All these years I have labored for you, and you never once gave me a kid to celebrate with my friends. So that's another kind of love, the love of a hireling, the mercenary. What is, in, what is in it for me? And the third kind is the love of a slave, which is that of fear. The slave fears punishment, and so he obeys because he's afraid of being punished. And I suppose we fall into one of those three categories um, at various times in our life. But please God, we make progress towards the love that children have for their father. So asking the question, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Our Lord answers directly from the scriptures. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. What does our Lord mean? Well, it is divine wisdom that speaks to us. And always we can delve into the veins of this, of the sayings of our Lord, and always find another um, vein of treasure. 
But essentially, we could say there are three ways in which we ought to love the Lord our God. Namely, we should love the Lord comparatively. That is, we should love him above everything else. This is what the first commandment says. You shall have no other God before me. We should love him compared with others above all. The second way is essentially by finality. He should be the beginning and the end, and most certainly the end of everything that we do. So when we undertake any tasks, we think, how does this fit into God's plan? Does God wish this? In other words, we seek him to do his will above all things. And the third is with affectivity. That is, that we want to do his will. We wish to do his will because it is good. We have all of our affections are generated to serve in him. And then our Lord adds, the second resembles it. You must love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say we should love ourselves because we do that naturally. It's innate. We don't need to be commanded to love ourselves. We do no injury to ourselves, at least not knowingly and deliberately. And so we are to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So the good that we desire for ourselves, that also we should desire for our neighbor. And the evil we would hate to befall us, we should not wish that on our neighbor. In fact, Tobit, uh, to, to, um, Tobit gave his son Tobias exactly that advice. Whatever you do not want others to do to you, do not do to them. And our Lord gives us the positive. Do unto others as you'd like them to do unto you. So in loving our neighbor, we treat them exactly as we ourselves would like to be treated. And today's feast, that of Jean Francis Chantal, de Chantal, we have an example of such a person who loved God and loved her neighbor. Born about the year 1572, her of fairly wealthy parents, her mother died when she was just 18 months. She was brought up by her father with her siblings, and her father was a very devout man, and he trained his children, first of all, to think in a Christian way. And so no subject, and this was unusual for the time, no subject was close to the, closed to them. They would discuss it freely, but always he would direct their minds so that they could see the hand of God and the purpose of God in everything that they did. As a young girl deprived of a mother, she took Our Lady as her mother and cultivated a deep love for Our Lady. She, consequently, she had a love for Christ, the Son of the Virgin. And so much so that it naturally flowed into the love of the Church. When she was offered, about the age of 18, a very favorable marriage, she rejected it outright because the proposed bridegroom was a Protestant. She said, I will never marry someone who hates my God and his church. And she did contract a marriage some four years later, by the age of 21, to Baron de Chantal, Christophe de Chantal, whom she fell very much in love with. The problem was that he, not only, he came with a title, but also with many debts. But she did not let that worry her because her trust was in God. And very much like the first, the first reading, it speaks of the faithful woman, the strong woman. She set herself to, um, to keep the household and was able to 
cancel his debts. She was able to pay them off by her industry. But what was really striking was the love that she had for the poor. And despite the fact that she was in debt herself, she never failed to feed the poor personally as they came to her door. And the, as we know, there are people who take advantage. And so there would be this line of um, indigent people and she would give them bread as they came. And as soon as they, there was some, as soon as they received the bread, they'd go to the back and join the queue again. And of course, this was brought to her attention. And she simply replied, if I were to go to the Lord a second time asking for the same thing, wouldn't I want him to give it to me? And so she had no problem with this which showed that, her, one, her total dependence on the Lord, and secondly, an understanding of human nature. She had six children, two of them died in infancy. And then tragedy struck. Her brother was killed. She lost her husband in an accident. In fact, it was in a shooting accident, and she had she went into a deep depression, found it impossible to forgive the man who had robbed her of someone whom she had loved. And it was in this state of depression that she went to a retreat which was given by St. Francis de Sales. And in it, he spoke about the love of God in which God forgives us everything. And so gradually, she was able to forgive the man who had Uh, accidentally killed her husband and to such an extent that she consented to be the godmother of one of his children. In this depression she went back to her family home and her father-in-law who was then in his 70s um, and a very um, vain and bullish kind of man demanded that she return to his home. If she did not, he would disinherit her. She was afraid for the children, because her children also would be disinherited. So she went back to her father-in-law's home, her father-in-law being a widower. And there she had to suffer much insult from the servants for the simple reason that her father-in-law gave them permission, the kind of man he was. They could see that the father-in-law, the master, the baron, had no great love for her, so the servants would take advantage. And she found this very difficult to bear. St. Francis de Sales was her her, um, spiritual director, and she spoke to him in depth about her situation. And wanted, in fact, to lead, to join a, a, a convent. But St. Francis dissuaded her until they reached a certain point when Francis decided that he was going to found the order of the visitation. And it's at this point that um, St. Jane Fran- um, Fran- Francis decided that she would, in fact, leave and she would be the foundress of this order by by St. Um, Francis de Sales. The problem was her children. She had to separate herself from her children, but she had made up her mind because she was convinced that this was what God wanted of her. Her son, a 15 year old, begged her not to leave. And in fact, he barred the door so she could not depart. But she simply stepped over his body and left. We can imagine that she had to tear herself to leave in her children and follow in the will of God. But that's what she did. She founded the order of the visitation. What was interesting is that she knew St. Francis even before she met him because providence had arranged for them to dream about each other. So they knew they'd met each other in dreams. And this is a, a peculiarity of the visitation order because the some 200 years later when um, Catherine, St. Catherine Labore 
she had often dreams about the order that she would join, and she always saw this old priest um, whom she didn't know. In fact, when she eventually she entered the convent of the visitation, she saw this picture, and it was, in fact, St. Vincent de Paul, who then was the spiritual director for the congregation. But anyway, nonetheless, so she established this convent. It was supposed to be an open convent in as much as the primary purpose was the works of mercy. They were to feed the poor, to look after the sick, and so on. But it was a novel idea, and it didn't take off very well. The other thing that she did was that she would accept anybody, any woman, into the congregation. Again, which is uh, unusual, because up until this time, only young women or wealthy women and healthy women were allowed to join the convents. But she chose anyone and everyone, or rather they chose her, and she would accept them and embrace them. She, the eldest novice she chose was 83 years old, which was at that time unthinkable. And when she was criticized for this, she said, the Lord accepted whoever came. Why should she make distinctions? And so by the time St. Francis de Sales died, there were already some 10 houses of the congregation. And when St. Jane Francis herself died, there were over 170 houses spread um, throughout France and in other countries. And the primary work was always to look after the poor, to look after the sick, to look after the destitute. Um, and so the, she, she had a great deal of difficulty um, in as much as the house, the, the convent, was frequently without the basic necessities. But that didn't stop her from giving even what was necessary, and especially in the time of plague, so that it seems sometimes the sisters themselves would die of starvation. But as we know, the, the God always provides, and the problem, of course, for us, he only waits till the very last moment to provide what we need. But that was her experience. And so she um, died with, in the order of sanctity and was canonized um, within a hundred years of her death. Her spiritual director after St. Francis de Sales was, in fact, St. Vincent de Paul. And so we have this incredible friendship among the saints. But where does this friendship come from? It always stems from a love of God first and foremost, because it is only in loving God with, with um, comparatively, loving God finally, as a finality, and loving God with all affectivity, all our affections, that we can actually love our neighbor. And of course, in doing this, we fulfill what our Lord himself has said. We have fulfilled the whole law, as well as what the prophets teach. Let us then ask that we should have such a love of God that we will love our neighbor as ourselves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.